All right, guys, so watch and listen carefully while we go through this. Okay, name the following compounds. Well, number one, NH4 is ammonium. And Cl is chlorine, so this is ammonium chloride. Okay, no capital letters. And the second one is molecular compound. It is going to be dinitrogen. Okay, tribromide. Again, no capital letters. Questions on the first two? Okay, give the formula for the following compounds. Iron 3 nitrate. So, iron, and the 3 tells me it's 3 plus with nitrate, which is NO3, and that's a minus 1. So when I drop and swap, I will require brackets. FENO3, bracket 3, okay, for that one. Okay, and the fourth one, okay, boron triiodide, so BI3. Questions on those two? So, indicate whether the following compounds will be soluble or not. So we probably need a solubility chart for that. Okay, so our first one okay, is uh, lead to chloride, and I can tell you right now, that one's insoluble, I know that one off the top of my head, okay, that one's insoluble, so if they have I, or not soluble, or insoluble, okay, that's fine, I'm pretty sure AGI is also not soluble, okay, but we'll have a look, okay, iodine is right here, soluble with most things, not with silver, okay, so that one is also insoluble, okay, number seven, sodium and nitrate, we said yesterday, basically anything with nitrate is soluble, okay, and the last one, calcium sulfide, pretty sure that is also on the soluble list. Yep, okay. So S with CA is soluble. All right, so that stuff is an S. Okay, one mark each for those. Okay, and then the stuff we talked about yesterday. Identify the type of reaction that's occurring. And I tried to make it really easy by using the example for this type of reaction, for this type of reaction. This is a... Simple decomposition reaction. Okay. And in a reaction that starts with a hydrocarbon reacting with oxygen, finishing with carbon dioxide and water is a combustion reaction. Okay, so it's out of 10. All right, give my mark out of 10. Let them see it. Put it in the box. Then back to your desk. Okay, so what we're going to be uh, going over, guys, in this toxins project is this, okay? This isn't just going to be uh, you report to me all of this stuff about this chemical compound or whatever it happens to be that you're going to choose, okay? We've we got to look at it in a little bit of a different light than you might have done in a, in a junior high report, okay? What we're looking for here is not just for you to tell me, you know, the interesting stuff about this chemical, you know, why is it toxic and all that kind of stuff, but also how does it affect our society as a whole, all right? Because let's say you're you're choosing to do your toxins project on uh, on a drug, okay? It's not a drug that you use, hopefully, okay? Um, if it has negative effects, okay? So hopefully no one is you know using heroin in here or something like that, okay? If you chose to do your toxin project on something like that, it doesn't affect you because you don't use it, but it does affect you indirectly because of the things that happen with people who do, okay? It is a toxic chemical, and as a result, it does certain things to people's brains. And these things cause them to make poor decisions that might, let's say, land them in jail. Who pays for that? Taxes. Who pays taxes? Yeah, you might not yet, but you will, because there's only two certainties in life. Death and taxes. And they even find a way to tax you after you're dead. Believe it or not, there's a death tax. Yeah, 
Okay, it costs money to die apparently. <laughs> All right. Um, so yeah, you got to watch out for stuff like that. Okay. Um, but that's certainly a societal effect. Okay, you or I make better decisions. We choose not to do that. Okay, but it's still affecting us, and it's still costing us. Okay, if somebody in our society gets sick through no fault of their own, who pays for that? Taxes. Us. Okay. We believe as Canadians that it's our responsibility to take care of each other when we're sick. Okay, and that's a great idea. Okay, but it costs a lot of money. All right? Do you know how much healthcare costs in Alberta? A billion dollars a day. A day to run healthcare in Alberta. Okay, I mean, you think about it. How many hospitals are there in this province? A lot. Okay, I mean, there's pretty much one in every town that has a population of over about six or seven hundred people, except for us. For some reason, we don't have one. Okay, why? Because it's only 10 minutes to get to that one over there in Calgary, right? So, yeah, we probably didn't need one. There's one in High River that's also only about 15 minutes away. But there's a lot of hospitals, and there's a lot of people who work in those hospitals, okay? And those hospitals have to be heated, powered, supplied with water, okay? Supplied with surgical supplies, you know, all kinds of stuff that you need to treat people with. And that stuff is all very expensive. Right? There's transportation costs. Okay? If you uh, go in and have a blood test, they have to transport your blood to the lab. Okay? All of that costs money. It's huge. It's a huge expenditure. Okay? It's a good expenditure, but it's huge. That's a societal cost to everyone. If there's a toxic chemical out there and, we're all, you know, and people are being exposed to it through no fault of their own, it's costing you money okay? as, a, as a member of our society. So what we want to look at here are, are there some societal effects? to these toxic chemicals. Okay, everyone kind of following me there? Yeah, all right. So in this project, you need to, uh, uh, first off, examine the effect of long-term exposure to a toxic chemical. Okay, this includes not only the health effects of the chemical on the people exposed, but like we said, the societal costs, health care, taxation, government regulations. Okay, like on some things that are not good for you, but that are legal, you pay taxes when you buy them, right? I mean, if you choose to smoke cigarettes, those are not good for you. And you are going to end up sick at some point because they're that bad for you, okay? Well, you might as well start investing in your future health care with every pack you buy, okay? And that's the purpose of making you pay what we call the sin tax, okay, on things like cigarettes and alcohol, okay, and, uh, and stuff like that. Everyone follow me? All right, we're trying to find a way to get those people who make a decision to do something bad for them to put in a little extra money to take care of themselves later. All right, it's kind of what it looks like. All right, um, so we got healthcare, the government regulations. Do you have to be a certain age? Okay, is it actually legal? Like, does the or does the government say this stuff is illegal? You will get arrested and thrown in jail if you are found to be in possession of it. Okay, um, do you have to go through certain security checks to be able to get your hands on this stuff? Okay, some things like you know, let's say dynamite, are not something you can run down to Walmart and buy. Okay, there are certain government regulations on your ability to possess that material. All right. Unless, you know, you're the Unabomber and find a way to make it out of diesel fuel and fertilizer. Okay? Yeah. There's crazy people out there. All right. Um, and impacts of people using or being exposed to this chemical. Behavioral costs. Okay? And by behavioral costs, I'm not, I don't mean a dollar figure. I mean, is it possible you could get mugged by a heroin addict on the street because he's got no money to buy for his next fix? Is that a societal cost? It certainly is, okay? Those are things to think about. Those are behavioral costs, okay? Addiction treatments, okay? Again, a lot of addiction treatment is publicly funded. It takes place in correctional facilities. It takes place in hospitals, all right? And that comes out of taxpayers' pockets, okay? But again, is that a good thing? We, yeah, we want to treat people who have addiction problems. It's our responsibility to do so. If we can treat them, they're less likely to be a cost later. Okay, so it's it's all a good thing. Okay, uh, emotional impacts. Okay, does it affect people um, who maybe are let's say related to or close to uh, people who have been exposed to toxic chemicals? All right, um, does it affect their ability to go to work because they have to stay at home and take care of this person? Okay, if that's the case, they might end up on social assistance, okay, welfare or something like that because they have to stay home to look after this person who maybe through no fault of their own was hurt. Right? All of that stuff is societal kinds of costs. 
Okay? So the scope of this paper goes beyond an examination of the health issues to encompass societal effects as well, and that's what we've just been talking about. Okay? So some suggestions for your project could be health hazards due to excessive consumption of alcohol and nicotine or other drugs, exposure to toxic substances, okay? and I put this one in kind of as a joke, uh, mercury that are in amalgam dental fillings. You guys probably don't have any of these, but your parents might. I have one. Okay? The silver fillings? Okay. Yeah, they, uh, there was this big scam about 10 years ago, maybe it was 15 years ago now, where these dentists in the States were creating this kind of fear-mongering where they were telling everyone that the mercury that was in their fillings was going to kill them. Okay? There's more mercury in a can of tuna than there is in a dental filling. Okay? And last time I checked, my filling wasn't dissolving. It's still there. It's been there for about 25 years. Okay. Yeah. It's not hurting me any. Okay. I'm not showing any weird effects of mercury poisoning. But they had this big scam out there, and they were making tons of money, and they ended up in jail for fraud. Okay. Um, but there are certain things, obviously, that are that we're exposed to, and there's not much we can do. Okay. Um, you know, certain kinds of fish are higher in mercury, depending on where you catch them. Okay, maybe you're not supposed to eat them. All right, uh, radon buildup in homes that can happen. Okay, um, the toxic mold that we sometimes find in in houses. Okay, especially after all this flooding that happened. Okay, there's certainly going to be you know issues with with uh, with mold and things like that in in homes in the next little while. Okay. Um, are there environmental concerns related to handling storage and disposal of these things? Okay, I mean, if you, um, you know, are running, you know, let's say like um, a smelting plant or something like that, some of the stuff that comes off of that is toxic, like the tailings ponds that they have up in Fort McMurray. Okay, um, they had an issue in northern BC here this summer where uh, a nuclear plant had it, the cooling ponds dam break. Okay, and a bunch of the irradiated cooling water ended up okay uh, getting into some rivers. Okay, well that's a big deal. We probably should have had better regulations on at least how to store okay and keep that material so that it wasn't going to be affecting people. Okay, things like that to think about. All right, so the outline of your project is it's essentially two parts. Tell me about the chemical. Okay, so the chemical nature of your toxin. What type of chemical is it? Ionic, molecular, organic? Is it just an element? Okay, you got to tell me that. Okay, how is its chemical structure related to, ex to its toxicity? That could be something like, well, it's an acid, so it has a hydrogen ion that comes off and makes solutions it gets into acidic or something like that. Okay, so you need to tell me, what is it about this thing that makes it toxic? All right, like uh, carbon monoxide. Has its chemical nature is that it bonds to hemoglobin stronger than oxygen. Okay, and that's okay means your blood can't carry oxygen properly. Okay, stuff like that. All right. Um, how does it cause damage to human tissue? All right. So what does it do when it gets into your body? What specifically does it do by its chemical action? Okay. Does it like literally eat away your flesh, or does it um, affect the way that your brain sends impulses? Uh, does it affect um, you know let's say muscle of the heart or something like like that? Is everyone following me there? Okay. Um, and then what are its toxic effects sort of related to that? Okay. And what symptoms may a victim exhibit? Okay. Um, so what kind of signs are they going to show? How would they be diagnosed? People that have heavy metal poisoning often have um, kind of issues with their hair, and they tend to get striping on their fingernails. Okay, because the way your body makes keratin, which is what your hair and fingernails are made out of, okay, um, is affected by heavy metals, and so you get this weird banding pattern on your fingernails if you have that. Okay, um, for the societal effects, that's a bit more open because it's different for every for every chemical. Things to explore maybe whether the exposure to the toxin is by choice. Okay, or if it's in the workplace where you really don't have any way around that, or maybe it's in nature. Okay, uh, what are the costs? And I I don't mean a dollar figure, because okay? that's going to be really hard for you to find. How many millions of dollars does it cost? To, you know, f for this in a year, don't look for that. Okay, I'm looking for if there's a lot of people affected by this. Are there, let's say, longer wait times in the emergency room? Uh, will you have to wait longer to get an MRI? Okay, or something like that. Okay, is it producing a load on the system that might affect you, even though you're not directly affected by that chemical yourself? Okay, everyone follow me there? I mean, you know how long it takes. If you're not willing to pay for a private MRI, you can wait up to six months, okay, to get an MRI. 
right? There's that much of a weight. So, okay, things like that are certainly a health concern, okay, or societal concern. Um, how many man hours are lost to illness? Okay, that costs that costs money, right? When people are away from work, right? For example, if I'm sick, okay, if I'm sick as a teacher, I still get paid for that day. Right? I have a certain number of sick days that I'm allowed to have. Okay? So my salary still gets paid, but they also have to pay the substitute who comes in for me. So if I'm sick, it costs the school double that day for these four classes that I teach. Okay? And that's a big deal. That adds up. All right? If you've got someone who's sick for, you know, let's say, three months, you know, maybe they developed cancer and had to be put on long-term disability, they're still getting paid. Okay? And whoever replaced them is also getting paid. Okay? And as a public sector employee, my pay comes from taxes. Okay, okay, I'm a government employee. My mon my money comes from my money. Oddly enough, anyway. Okay, um, yeah. So those are things to think about. Okay, are there government regulations? Okay, related to that toxin exposure limits. Okay, uh, age regulations. Is it legal to possess the substance? Are there disposal requirements? Okay, um, things like that. Uh, and then, finally, an opinion. So at the end, after you've talked about all of that kind of stuff, okay, what are your feelings on it? Okay, uh, should there be tighter regulation? Should it be banned completely? Should it be allowed? Okay, um, that kind of thing. Now, lastly, and this is the part people really mess up most often, so you might want to circle or highlight this part. Okay, citing your references. Okay, you're going to be doing research off the internet, okay, you still have to cite the page. You have to give credit, okay, to the people whose information you are using. All right. Now, the other thing you have to be aware of: copying and pasting, as you were told in that assembly on the first day, is not research. Okay, it's cheating. It's plagiarism. It's illegal. All right. If you get caught plagiarizing in university, does anyone know what happens to you? You get expelled, and you don't get a refund either. Okay, and university is expensive, and not only do you, ex do you get expelled from that university, but the fact that you plagiarize something will follow you, because if you apply to another one, you have to write on your application what other universities you've attended, and they'll do a background check, and if they find out you got expelled for plagiarism, you are probably not going to get in somewhere else. It's almost like a criminal record, okay, and it will follow you around, so plagiarism is a big deal, okay? The big deal for me isn't so much that you know it's you could get kicked out of university, whatever. You're not going to learn anything if you do it. Okay, that's my big concern. All right. So yeah, read people's websites. Okay, and then take from that something. Okay, but don't literally take from that something. Okay, you have to process it through your head as opposed to copy it over. All right. Now, where you cite that is in your bibliography, which happens at the end. Okay, it should be the last thing in your project. All right. In the bibliography, you need to cite your information in the following way. Since you're probably just going to be using uh, websites, you're going to cite it like this, and only like this. Okay. The name of the author. Last name first. First name last. Okay, so McIlroy Ann okay, is the author of this article. That is often hard to find, oddly enough. On the internet, sometimes people just like to spout off and then do it anonymously. Okay, when you read someone's stuff, try and find the tone of what they're writing. If it sounds like somebody spouting off, okay, especially if the name of the website is Crackpot Joe's website about crack, okay. Yeah, that's probably not a really reliable source of information, okay? He's probably some guy who lives in his mom's garage and hacks the net all day and, yeah, okay, yeah, we don't want kind of that kind of stuff as your information. Look for credible places. Credible places are more likely to have the author's names on them, all right? So, something you want to look for. Then, you need to put on the date the article was posted, hopefully nothing older than you, like that. Okay, um, and then the name of the article. All right, so we've got the, the date the article was posted. Okay, usually you can find that. If you can't, it's the last day the site was updated. All right, and you can always find that. Okay, then the name of the article. In this case, it's Vive le Quebec, Vive le Canada. Okay, and then the name of the website, not the URL, 
the name of the website. In this case, the name of the website was the Daily News. Okay, it might be for you guys, um, maybe the Center for Disease Control. Okay, or um, Environment Canada. Okay, or something like that. Okay, then you'll have the URL. So www. I swear I won't copy this stuff. com. Okay, that has to be on there as well. And then the last thing is the day you accessed it, which would be September eighteenth. 2014. All right. Everyone good with that? All right. So that's how you cite a website. If you use a book, okay, or a magazine or something like that, okay, then you cite it like this. If someone in your family maybe works in a field where is that is related to this and you want to ask them about it, okay, you simply cite that as personal interview with so and so, okay, with uh, you know, Mr. Smith um, on this date. Okay? So personal interview with so and so on this date. All right? That's all you have to do to cite a personal interview. All right? Everyone follow me on that one. Okay. So that's what we're looking for there. And the first thing, I know it seems odd. I just talked about the last thing, but here's the first thing that should appear in there. Planning. All right? I need to see some evidence that you planned this out. All right? What I mean by planning, okay? I would like to see a thought web and I would like to see an outline. All right? So, um, sorry, uh, sorry, a thought web or an outline and a timeline. Okay? So, one or the other of these, whichever makes more sense to you, and a timeline. All right, so on that timeline, I want you to be planning out when you're going to work on this, okay? When you're going to do certain things, getting it done early, having Mr. Coderre look at it, all of that kind of stuff can get put on there. All right, it's not going to be due until October the second, so it's two weeks, okay? So plan out when you're going to work on stuff, and maybe sometimes you just work on it. You know, you didn't. Oh, I got a couple of minutes, and I have this thought. I'm going to quickly write it down. Write that on your timeline. Okay, had a thought, wrote it down, Boom. September 19th, you know, or whatever. All right, so that shows me that you've at least considered how you're going to put your report together before. All right, um, now the scope, okay, you're going to get two days today and tomorrow in class to work on this, okay, but that's probably not going to be enough to do a good job of it, okay. Um, what I'm looking for here is, okay, between 800 and 1,000 words, Okay, and I'm telling you guys, if your project is 800 words, you are not getting 100%. Okay, you can barely scratch the surface of this in 800 words. All right, um, so 800 to 1,000 is kind of the minimum. At the same time, I do not want a doctorate level thesis. Okay, that is three or four thousand words because I will probably get bored and stop reading at some point. Okay, so say what you need to say, and for most people, this ends up being around 1,500, maybe 1,800 words. Okay, roughly that comes out to if you make it 12 point font, one inch margin, single spaced, it's about two pages. Okay, so it's not huge, right? It's about two pages, and you got two weeks to do it. All right, so that's if you want to just do it as a strict report. If you want to do like a PowerPoint, okay, I've also included on the ass assignment that I've given you in Google Classroom, a Google Sheets template as well, which is Google's version of PowerPoint. All right, works just as good. Okay, you can do that, insert pictures and do whatever you want. Okay, if you'd like to do that, that's fine. You still need to have the same number of words. Okay, I will caution you with the PowerPoint. Um, on the PowerPoint, people tend to get really point formish. Okay, and I don't want to see a bunch of bullets, okay, that your whole project is bullet, 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 okay? It still needs to sound like it's coherent and that it's tied together and these ideas are related in some way, okay? So make sure that you're not falling into that trap where it just becomes a point form exercise, okay? So either way is fine, okay? I've included both templates on the assignment on Google Classroom. So there's a Google Docs template and there's a Google Sheets template, all right? Um, so whichever way you want to do it. Okay. If you make a thought web, um, that you might need to like do on paper and then snap a picture of it and insert it. Okay, and, and I can look at it that way. Right. Um, 
Yeah, so that should cover it. You're going to get marked in five categories. Each of the five categories is five marks. Initiating and planning. All right, so your thought web, your timeline. Okay, analysis and interpretation. Basically, what you said. Is it right? Does it make sense? Okay, things like that. Communication. Is what you wrote coherent? Okay, does it, are the ideas tied together or is it hard for, or am I really having to do an exercise in like English literature and trying to figure out what the themes are in this thing? Okay, I, I'm not good at that. That's why I teach science. All right, uh, don't make me do that because it, prob it'll probably affect this mark a little bit. All right, um, so make sure that it makes sense. Make sure that it sounds like a 15 year old, 16 year old wrote it. Okay, because if I don't know some of the words, that's a pretty good sign you didn't write it. Okay, because I've actually done that to people. I've come in, brought their assignment, in and go, "Can you tell me what this word is?" And they can't be, they can't even pronounce it. I'm like, well, then what's it doing in your report? Okay, yeah, all right. And it's really easy, Mr. Mr. Lattle told you the first day. It's really easy for me to figure out whether you wrote it or not. All right, so let's not go there. Okay. At the same time, it should also not sound like my seven-year-old wrote it. Okay, it should. Okay, use good scientific terms, okay, and, and be coherent. All right, uh, research and investigation, that's going to be your bibliography. Okay, is your bibliography in the right format? Does it have uh, at least five references? Okay, because uh, we said here, um, yeah, at least five references. All right, does it have at least that many? Um, and is it in the right format? And then overall, okay, overall basically means when I look at it, are there no spelling mistakes? Is there no grammatical errors that interfere with my ability to, um, you know, to process what you're trying to write? Are there some visual aids, pictures, stuff like that? Okay, graphs maybe that are meaningful. Things that kind of keep my attention, okay, on your project. Okay. Questions on what you're doing? Is that right? Pardon me. You will not be presenting this now. It takes too long for us to do that. So you'll be handing it in to me, and I'll read them. All right. Any other questions? All right, then we'll get started.